welcome to the Battle and the Bride. Welcome back to The Battle and the Bride, where Christ is King and the Church his Bride. My name is Seth Dean, and this is a continuation of the series in Philippians that I've been preaching through at my local church. The passage this week comes to us from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus." who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you praising you for your word. We praise you, Father God, for how it has taught not just us, but the saints throughout the ages. We praise you that you have preserved it And Lord, that we get to read it today. Father, we pray for those who don't get to read it, but who gather to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we pray that you would be worshiped today in spirit and in truth. As we study this passage and as we learn more about you and about our lives in relation to you, we pray, Father, that these truths would go down deep And Lord, that we would be able to apply them to our lives, to the glory of God the Father. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In order to live like Christ, you must think like Christ. In order to live like Christ, you must think like Christ like Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, Paul gives us a command, a command to live in unity and a command to live in humility. And then he goes on to show us the example of Christ in these areas. He goes on to show us Christ's example of humility and not just humility, but he also shows us Christ's example of being exalted as a result of his humility. And then Paul does this. He does this in order to encourage us. He does it to encourage us to live humble lives in the expectation of sharing with Christ in eternal glory. And we're going to see this played out in three different ways. First, living in unity and humility as Christians in verses 1 through 5. Then we're going to see the example of Christ's humility in verses 6 through 8. And then in 9 through 11, we're going to see Christ exalted. Now, in my module in seminary this month, it's on biblical counseling. And Dr. Michael Lawyer, he was a pastor of counseling out of Christ Church out in Moscow, uh, He had this to say in the middle of his lecture, and it struck me as I was studying this passage. He said, the gospel is about living. It's the good news that puts you in a relationship with God, but now you get to live. As we come to this passage, he starts off with a therefore. So everything that Paul has described before, he's described his 
fellowship with the Philippians in the gospel. They're partakers of grace. They're sharing in this faith. They're sharing in sufferings. He gives his greeting. He tells them of his affection for them. He describes the situation that he's going through and he's describing the fact that he's rejoicing through it. And then he discusses his struggle as he, he considers whether I should stay in the flesh or go to be with the Lord. And that both are quite fine and he's quite content with whether he lives on and serves the Lord or whether he dies and goes to be with the Lord. And so he says that I'm going to stay in the flesh. I'm going to continue on. This is going to be for your benefit. It's going to be for producing fruit. And then he has this to say, and this is where the therefore comes in. He says, for to you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Therefore, so he's, he is writing to believers. Therefore, to you whom it has been granted to believe in Christ, to you whom it has been granted to suffer for Christ, this is being written to saved Christians, regenerate people in the church. He is saying, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. He's going to begin giving commands. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. When he's talking about this, this concept here, what he's conveying to them is you are saved to one faith. We are saved to one faith. He writes to the Ephesians the same thing. He says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We read in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There are not many gods, there are not many faiths, there are not many spirits, there are not many churches. There is one universal church. And he's saying, if you share in any of these things, if you have any comfort of love, any consolation in Christ, why would you have consolation in Christ? Because your sins have been forgiven. He's taken the penalty of your sins on him. And he rose from the dead. He lives forever. He's seated on the throne. If you have any consolation in that, or if you have any comfort of love, love for God, love for Christ, love for one another. Before I was saved, I did not have those things. I may have been in church, but I had no love for God. I had no affection for Christ. And I hated people. I did. But when I was saved, I was transformed. My heart was changed. The love of God was poured into my heart. And I began to love God, love Christ, love others. And that began to grow. It began to affect me. And he says, if you are sharing in these things, if you are Christians, if you are truly Christians, this is what it's going to look like. If so, here's the command. It's an imperative command. He's going to go on a slew of imperative commands. Now, what does an imperative command mean? It, it's, give, it's giving you instruction to do something. Wash your hands. That's an imperative. Tie your shoes. That's an imperative. His first is fulfill my joy. And how are you going to fulfill Paul's joy by being unified, unified. Unity is what he's looking for. As Christians, we must be like-minded. As Christians, we must have the same love. And as Christians, we must be of one accord, of one mind. When he says one mind, He's talking about the way that we're going to be unified. It's a way of thinking that translates into a way of living. When he uses the phrase, the word mind here, he's not just talking about, uh, you know, Frankenstein. You, you get to put a new brain in your head. He's talking about a way of thinking that translates into a way of living. It is a part of our sanctification 
to be of one mind. All right, children. Your catechism questions. Question number 51, what is sanctification? That's justification. <laughs> sanctification, it is God's making sinners holy in heart and conduct. Making sinners holy in heart and conduct. This means that we are being conformed more and more into the image of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Just like he says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is what happened to me? My mind was transformed. I received the love of God in my heart and he transformed my mind. It's a new way of thinking. It's the way of thinking about the church that unifies us and brings us together. It informs how we should act towards one another. This is how Paul's joy is going to be fulfilled. And he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. He is trying to warn us against pride. This lowliness of mind that he's talking about, it, it implies modesty, humility, having a humble opinion of oneself, not thinking wrongly of yourself, not elevating yourself higher than you should be, but looking at yourself rightly, but then also perceiving others correctly as well. Jonathan Edwards has a number of resolutions. And resolution number eight, he says, resolve to act in all respects, both speaking and doing, as if nobody had been so vile as I, and as if I had committed the same sins or had the same infirmities or failings as others. And then I will let the knowledge of their failings promote nothing but shame in myself and prove only on an occasion of my confessing my own sins and misery to God. What does that mean? It means when you see a sinner, you don't, you don't say, oh Lord, thank you that I'm not like that man. Amen. That was the, the sin of the Pharisee when he saw the publican. The publican said, oh Lord, forgive me for I'm a, I'm a sinner. And who went home justified? The publican. We as Christians, we cannot, we must resist the the urge to be proud, to view others in a way that makes us say, oh, Lord, thank you. I am not like that person. Lord, thank you. You've made me so much better. And boy, aren't I better. No. And we do it in more subtle ways than that. That's pretty overt. But we, we can justify the way that we think about others negatively. We need to beware of pride. That's what Paul is conveying. That's the negative way to put, to put this. He's saying it in a very positive manner. He's saying, put others first. Make sure that, that you are doing nothing through selfish ambition, nothing through, through vain conceit. Let nothing be done in that way. But in humility, with this modest approach to esteeming yourself, esteem others better than yourself. Pride is what caused the devil to fall into condemnation. And it's what we need to be aware of as Christians. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, we get a very vivid glimpse of the pride that caused the devil to fall into condemnation. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. 
I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. This is what we tend to do. And this is the same sort of pride that caused Adam and Eve to fall in the garden. It will make you like God, this fruit, knowing good from evil. Don't you see? Don't you see? It's good. It's pleasing to the eye. It's good for obtaining wisdom. You're perfectly justified in disobeying the Lord. And so they believed the lie. And they took the fruit and they fell. So Paul is warning them against this. He is saying, because you are saved, here is now how you should think. You should think in this way, with lowliness of mind, with humility. And then he says, let this mind be in you. This is his final imperative. What mind? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now remember, mind, this is the way of thinking that's going to inform your actions. This way of thinking was also in Christ Jesus. Christ's humility. We'll come to verses 6 through, through 8. We see Christ humbling himself. We see Christ's mind being exemplified. He's, going, he's now giving you the commands. Now he's going to give you an example. And later on in the passage, he's going to go on. He's going to give you a, an application for how to, to go about doing this. But right now we're looking at the example of Christ. And Christ's mind is that being in the form of God, being in the form of God, Calvin says that when you see this phrase being in the form of God, we are talking about the majesty that Christ had. Being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That phrase, consider it robbery, it means a thing to be held fast to or retained. If you're talking about pirate treasure or something that you have sought after and found uh, you know, through much blood, sweat, and toil, it's something that you would grasp onto. You see all those pirate movies where everyone's betraying everyone else to get the, the treasure and the treasure map. They're grasping onto that thing. And it said this thing, uh, this, is, this majesty was not a thing to be held fast to or retain. He did not consider it. It is an attitude formed in the mind. He humbled himself in verse 8. It's an attitude. He humbled himself. Now, what does this majesty look like? Why is this such a big deal? I mean, it's easy to say that Jesus created heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Nothing was made without him. Everything that is made, he made. But in order to get a vivid glimpse of why this is so important, you have to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And in John chapter 12, he gives us a little bit of context for this. John 12, verses 39 through 41, when he says, Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. 
Whose glory? The glory of Jesus Christ. When Isaiah beheld the glory, the majesty, the form of Jesus Christ, what was his response? I am undone. Woe to me. It was fear. It was trembling. He came face to face. He was in the presence of the Lord of hosts and he was only aware of his sinfulness and his inability to stand before God. Almighty God, the almighty glory that disintegrates mere mortals, he took on flesh. He endured hardships, hunger, suffering, reviling, pain, even becoming our curse on the cross. Do you see the difference now between the passages in Isaiah that we just read? Isaiah 6, where all glory, honor, and majesty is due to the Lord Jesus. And then in Isaiah 14, where you see Lucifer trying to elevate himself to that level or above. Lucifer's promise was that he would be crushed. He would be brought down to Sheol. Now Christ, he is in that position. And he made himself of no reputation. It means that he emptied himself. He emptied himself. Now, this is a passage that a lot of people use to say that he emptied himself of his divinity, but he did not empty himself of anything. He emptied himself by doing something. He emptied himself by becoming like those who he created to serve. Now, if you were to, to uh, go out of your way, you saw an old woman trying to cross the street and she'd fallen over and you see it and you sprint to her and you lift her up in the midst of traffic and take her to safe, safe keeping, lift her up yourself. You have to carry her with oncoming traffic and all the dangers associated with that and get her on the other side. You could say, man, I emptied myself to, to come and get you. But that doesn't mean you change anything about your nature. You're still a man, you still, but you've exerted yourself. You've humbled yourself in that situation and placed yourself in danger to save this, this lady who couldn't help herself. Jesus Christ not emptied himself of anything. He did not lose his divinity. He humbled himself by becoming like those he created to serve him. He became obedient to the point of death. There was no rebellion which led to his suffering. That's the big difference. That's the key difference between him and us. Our suffering is a result of our sin in the sinful world that we live in. When Jesus suffered on the cross, it was not because of any rebellion or sin in him. It was joyful obedience to suffer on behalf of of those who are joyfully disobedient. This attitude of humility is what compelled him to do so. Now, children, you're going to get a, a chance to redeem yourself. I've got another question for you. What kind of life did Christ live on earth? All right, do you think you can get two in a row? What kind of death did Christ die? Excellent. Well done. So what, is this, what does this look like? I mean, I just gave the illustration of a man trying to save a woman, but this emptying yourself and humbling yourself in order to, to achieve a goal. Now, imagine if you just had a day, one of those days, where the alarm didn't go off, Everything started off wrong. You, you get to work and everything's gone wrong at work. Say you, something happened, somebody did something six months ago and then you, gotta, you found out about it. You gotta call up your boss. You gotta get an earful from him. You're just putting out fires constantly and by the time you're done at work, you are exhausted. You're driving home and all you can think about is nothing because you don't have any capacity left to think. 
Um, but you are looking forward to getting home and you open the door to the sound of screaming in one corner and more screaming and crying in this corner and your wife you meet who is wearing the exact same thing that she was wearing when she got out of bed that morning and holding a baby and on, immediately you're struck with a list of this happened, this happened, this didn't happen, you forgot this and this needs fixed and this needs fixed. Now, in that moment, you have a choice you could do the cowardly thing and turn around and keep driving and abdicate your responsibility completely, which some men do. Or you could say, I'm not gonna take care of that right now, woman. It's been a hard day, just leave me alone. Then you go grab a spot on the couch and open, pop a beer open and uh, start watching TV. Um, another option though, is that you can take account of what's going on. And you have just been through the worst day. And even though you are now encountered with more difficulties, you take a moment, you take a breath, you take inventory, and you take responsibility. And you start working. You start doing it, even though you have nothing left in you. This is what humility looks like. It's taking responsibility in those times, in those seasons, where all you wanna do is put yourself first. All you wanna do is just go forget about the world. All you wanna do is just find something to comfort you because you think you deserve it. When in reality, you have a responsibility. And you take care of it. Now Christ, is such a tremendous example because if he had stayed in heaven, he would have committed no sin. There was nothing that required him to humble himself. We were the ones who sinned. We were the ones who rebelled. Our sin, the wages of it are death. And in fact, if he just levied death on each one of us, it would be just, God would be good. But instead, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And Paul's telling us, this is the way of thinking for the Christian. This is the way that you need to be thinking. This attitude needs to constantly be in you. Because this attitude is going to inform your actions. If you want to be more Christ-like, think in this way. Put others before yourself, your family before yourself. Put your church members, your fellow believers before yourself. It doesn't mean you become less of yourself. And in fact, we have a promise in 9 through 11. An example of Christ being exalted as a result of his humility and his humbling and his death. Where Lucifer was taken from this position that was appointed to him, and as a result of his pride, he was knocked down to the lowest point in creation, to Sheol, to destruction. Christ, who was at the highest point, humbled himself, died the death. He descended to the grave, but then he was resurrected, glorified, ascended into heaven, and is seated there at the right hand of God the Father. In Matthew 28, 18, he says, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In Acts 5, 31, him, Jesus, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And just like we saw the throne room of God in Isaiah, we're going to get a glimpse of it in Revelation chapter five. Now that Christ has humbled himself and has now been glorified and exalted, we see, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, 
Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb! who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Do you see the difference now? Isaiah, his experience was to say, woe to me, I am undone. I am of unclean lips. He knew he was in peril. But Christ, by becoming man, fully God and fully man, humbling himself to death on a cross, was exalted and is exalted now so that ten thousands of ten thousands of ten thousands innumerable people can stand there and not be afraid, but can worship him forever and ever. Do you realize that you and I are counted in that number? We will one day stand and worship the lamb who was slain. He redeemed us, though. He redeemed us, not just for salvation's sake, but he made us kings and priests to our God. We shall reign on the earth. Christ is exalted, and those who humble themselves and trust in Christ, they too will also find glory. Calvin writes, for from the most abject condition, he was exalted to the highest elevation. Everyone, therefore, that humbles himself will in like manner be exalted. Who would now be reluctant to exercise humility by means of which the glory of the heavenly kingdom is attained? We are saved. We are saved for glory and to to glory. I've read this many times while studying Philippians, but in Romans 8, 16 through 18, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I, considering that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And again, later in that chapter, he says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Glory. This way of thinking Paul is communicating to us. It's the way that Christ thinks. It is the complete antithesis to how we think as a natural man. Our flesh wants us to be selfish, to put ourselves first. But if we have the mind of Christ, and we have the mind of Christ, then our thinking, our way of thinking is going to be transformed so that our actions will be transformed. We're going to begin thinking of things differently, prioritizing things differently in our lives, prioritizing people differently, esteeming people in the way that Christ views them and not as the world would have us see them. So those whom the Lord has saved, he requires us to lay down our pride and die. It's appropriate. Our pride is mud. Our works are not worth mentioning. Before we are saved, we have nothing righteous in us that we could boast about before the Lord. And none are righteous, no, not one. When God saves us, that righteousness, the righteousness that we boast of is the righteousness of Christ. For he humbled himself and he took my sins, my shame, and in return, he gave me his righteousness. He humbled himself to death. He was raised to new life and glory. And he will exalt all those who humble themselves. So let this mind of humility be in you. Let this way of thinking be in you towards your God, towards others, so that your way of living may be to the glory of of God the Father. So let's examine ourselves. Where, where are we prideful? Where are we boastful? Where are we resisting God? Are we boasting in our own glory? Or are we boasting in our weaknesses? Are we boasting in the Lord? If there's anything that the Holy Spirit's convicting you of, then humble yourself and repent. Humble yourself and repent. Men, have you humbled yourself before the Lord? The leadership and authority given to, to a man, you are the image and glory of God. But are you submitting to God who has given you that authority and that position? Are you loving your wife like Christ loved the church? Are you loving your children? Or out of pride, are you dominating them? Are you harsh and humiliating them, exasperating them? When you sin... When you sin against them, do you confess it to them? Do you model that for them, that humility? Or do you hide it and sweep it under a rug? Do you confess your sins at all to other Christians? Or out of shame, do you just hide? By modeling humility to your family, it's not weak abdication, but you're teaching them the antithesis to rebellion. You're teaching them the antithesis to pride. You're teaching them submission to true authority, submission to God, submission to your head. Humility. Women, have you humbled yourself before the Lord? Are you submissive to Jesus Christ as Lord? And if you're married, are you submissive to your husbands? You are the glory of man. But do you make comments about how lucky you are, he is that, that he married you or else he wouldn't be able to find his head? Do you slander him to others? Do you belittle him behind his back in front of your children? You mutter under your breath, neglect your own duties at home, live frustrated and cold because you wanted things to go differently? You shame your children. 
You talk nasty about them to their faces to elevate yourself, to put them in their place. In those times, though, do you humble yourself? You humble yourself before your Lord and God and confess your bad attitude. Do you submit yourself to the Lord's will and seek reconciliation with those who you've been trying to belittle and who you've been harsh with? Do you submit those things at the foot of the cross and die? Do you seek to have the mind of Christ so that you can glorify God in all circumstances in your conduct towards him, towards your husband, your children, and then glorify God in your duties? We were talking on the way here about the tremendous freedom there is in submitting, submitting to the Lord, and how sweet it is, and how the, the times that we have gone astray and we have not been submissive and we have been rebellion, the time, those times are the most grievous times. Those are the ones with the most conflict. It feels like you're, you're beaten up against a wall. But to confess those failings to the Lord and to have freedom, just well, like we said in the read in the opening psalm, he will beautify the humble with salvation. Children, you don't get off the hook either. I don't have a catechism question right now, but you too must let the mind of Christ be in you which means you must submit to Jesus Christ as Lord. You also must submit to your parents who are given over you. They're given to you as an authority. Do you listen to them? Do you obey them? Or do you talk back to them? Do you tell them how your way is better? I do have a question. What's the fifth commandment? What is the fifth commandment? Do you know it? Excellent. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. It is the first commandment with a promise. So are you doing that? Are you honoring your father and mother when they talk to you, when they give you commands, when they tell you to clean up your room or pick up your toys or to get ready for church? The world is trying to teach you that your parents are stupid and that you know better than them. If you follow the world and you follow that path, you will find yourself in a world of hurt, of pain, of misery, of loneliness, and of broken promises. I am telling you this from experience. The path of rebellion leads to death. So instead, put to death your rebellion. Humble yourself. Put to death your rebellion against your parents. They are leading you to know God and his salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who humbled himself and died for you even though you were rebellious. Even though I was rebellious. And let us love one another in humility. Not thinking ourselves better than the other, but, but praising God for the salvation that we all share. Praising God because of the humility and the exaltation of his precious son, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Oh, Father God, we come before you and we confess, Lord, that we are a prideful people, racked with pride. Our flesh rises up. The old man wants what it wants and will do whatever it can to get what it wants. So Lord, please forgive us for those times of pride and those times of rebellion and in the times of temptation where we give way to those things. Lord, we pray that we would crucify that rebellion and that pride. Lord, renew a right spirit within us. Father, unify us as believers. Unify us in Christ. Let the mind of Christ 
be prevalent in us. Lord, you have granted to us salvation. You have granted to us to suffer for the sake of Christ. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that as a result of that, you would also transform our minds so that we can think correctly in a world that so desperately wants to confuse us and teach us that self comes first, self-love. But Lord, let us be like Christ, thinking like him, acting like him, so that in the end it would not be us who are glorified, but it is all to the glory and the praise and the honor of God the Father. I pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Battle and the Bride. If you liked this episode, please subscribe, share, and leave a review. For more information, visit thebattleandthebride.com. If you have any questions, you can email us at thebattleandthebride at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and God bless.